So, uh, just to set expectations, right? I'm not, uh, I don't consider myself a supreme story storyteller, so I'm honored that Pari and team actually asked me to speak on this topic, but I'll do my best to give you a few tips and tricks that have worked for me in the past and that I've observed in people who have done great things and have convinced me through their storytelling. Can we have uh, slides, please? All right, sorry. OK, so let me start off. How many of you have watched the movie Inception? A lot of people have. What is the top doing right now? It is spinning. And in the movie, as the top spins, you realize that you are in a dream. In this case, it happens to be my dream. So by day, I'm Guru Bhatt, GM and head of engineering for PayPal. In my dreams, I'm Dan Schulman, the CEO of PayPal. Dan, if you're listening, it's just a joke. It's just a dream. I don't want your job. So let me take you back in time as Dan Schulman. The year is 2014. After a very successful stint at American Express, I have been approached by the board of PayPal to take on the company and lead it through a new phase. At that time, PayPal is a part of eBay. It's doing really, really well. The future is very bright. And I'm being asked to take on the company, lead it through a separation with eBay, and then take it into a brave new world. So what is my frame of mind as Dan Schulman when I'm looking at this? Because the company I'm inheriting is not one that is in need of a turnaround. It is doing phenomenally well as the numbers here will indicate. Everything is going gangbusters. The investors think that it's great. The employees think it's great. Shareholders think it's great. The board thinks everything is good. Nobody thinks that there is any change that is needed. Somewhat simpler if I was entering a situation where I had to turn around the company, where it was a do or die situation. I had to do something, and people would follow immediately. But in this case, the numbers don't lie. Things are going really, really well, which, I mean, companies are growing in double digits, 20 plus percent every year. How do I convince people that something different needs to be done? I have a ton of data, but do, is that what I use? Let's take a look at, I mean, the fine gentlemen behind, they're all the founders of uh, PayPal. There's Peter Thiel in there as well, Max Levichin, a bunch of really, really big stalwarts in the industry. And this, ladies and gentlemen, was the mission statement, the vision of PayPal in 2013. For heaven's sake, it even has the word promotional financing in it. But things are going really well. How do I, Dan Schulman, Dan, I'm just joking, just kidding. How do I convince not just the board, but the rank and file that we need to rethink our business and we need to find a different way of doing things? I have some data with me that backs up my case. I know that for the average American, even raising $400 in order to do something as simple as repair a car that gets me back and forth from work back to home every day is difficult to do in a period of even one month. It's absolutely impossible for me. So I know that there are people in desperate need of financial services. I know that for many people, Two-thirds of the American population, in fact, a large segment, lives paycheck to paycheck. If I were to find a way to help them save, I would help them lead better lives and open up business opportunities for PayPal as well. And I also know that it is extremely expensive to be poor. Americans in 2014 spent $138 billion in just getting access to financial services. Credit card fees, bank fees, overdraft fees, protection fees, etc. All of those. Now, if I were to carve a business opportunity in that, it would make my company much, much bigger. But if, I mean, I'm, I'm in the heart of Silicon Valley, so very, very intelligent, data-oriented people. 
Maybe I should just run these numbers by them. Maybe that will get them fired up and go to go in a new direction. Is that what I did? Yes, I did. I tried, but that didn't work out really well. So I resorted to telling a few of my own personal stories, something that I had experienced in my past. The first experience was I used to be the CEO of Virgin Mobile. And one of the things that we were doing was we were helping homeless youth through a charity. So in one of the employee events where we, we were meeting people from the charity, one of the folks who was running the charity told me, they said, the best way for you to realize how important this work is, is to actually live the life of a homeless person and see what an impact this is having on their lives. So a colleague and I, we decided, hey, what the hell, let's, let's try it out. Let's build greater empathy with the people that we are uh, helping. So one summer in New York, pretty warm, good weather, my colleague and I decided to spend an entire day as homeless people. It took me six hours to get even a single dollar to go buy something. People would just look past me and walk past me as if I was made of glass. People shooed me away. There was no place to sit down. There was no place to sit. There, there was no place to eat. There was no place to sleep. Finally, we ended up in a skateboard park, very dangerous place, rough people. You know, it, it didn't feel safe at all. And I did this just for one day, 24 hours in good weather. But it gave me a huge dose of empathy on what it is to be divorced from financial services in my day-to-day -day life. Then the next thing happened when I was a part of Amex. So when I was at Amex, again, somebody put me up to a challenge. They said, hey, why don't you spend a day assuming you don't have access to a bank, you don't have a credit history, and you have to lead your life. You have to wire money. You have to pay your utility bills. bills. Try and see what it looks like. So for an entire day, a set of my colleagues, we all went around trying to do this. We stood in lines endlessly at retail stores trying to pay our utility bills. We tried to wire money. These were locations that were not really, really safe. The fees were huge. I found out that A, it can feel like a part-time job just to manage your finances because of the amount of time that you spend in lines. Secondly, it is hugely disempowering to be poor. It is very expensive to be poor. These are the stories I repeatedly told all the employees, the board members, etc., at PayPal to get them to open up to a new reality that the company has to shift in a different direction in order to truly live up to its potential. Now, do you want to see what the mission statement of PayPal looks like today? We fundamentally believe that access to financial services opens up lives. It empowers people. So that's why we are committed to the cause of democratizing access to financial services. And through that, we believe that more people and businesses can join and thrive in the global economy. Compare this to a mission statement, a vision statement that had words like promotional financing, mobile devices, brand, bank accounts, credit cards, in-store, etc. This is a lot more empowering. And the reason this was possible was because of some powerful stories that I told different audiences in order to get them to connect with this mission. Now, I don't have, I don't want to sell the company, but thanks to this kind of a vision, we have tripled in size from the numbers I showed you. We are north of $100 billion in market cap now. Our revenues have close to tripled. And all that is possible because we looked at a business in a different way. I will exit my Dan Schulman hat right now, the top has stopped spinning, and uh, unfortunately the slide is not proceeding. All right, um, so when do we use, you know, this is a great story, Dan Schulman turning around the company through stories. But is that the right paradigm to use for everything that you want to do? Recently had, I had the occasion where we had uh, an ops review call, where we were just going through a review of what's happening on a project, and uh, one of the engineers uh, wrote to me over email and said, hey, Guru, I want to start with a story. I want to lead with a story. A bunch of VPs are listening to this, and I want to tell them what's happening through a story. Not really the best of ideas. These are extremely busy people. They've got an hour to look at the metrics based on which they're measuring your progress. 
they don't want to listen to stories. Don't put the cart before the horse. A storytelling paradigm is not suited for everything. It's not really good to manage things. It's great to inspire and lead. All right, I should be... Which way should I be pointing? All right. So, for example, let's say you want to... Sorry. Seems to be having some trouble here. All right. Let's say you want to acquire a company. Let's say you want to enter a new market. Do you lead with a story? No, you still have to do the hard work of crunching the numbers, building a go-to-market strategy. You have to do all of that. It's not going to be possible for you to just get to telling a story and convincing the board and rallying the troops, etc. After all the groundwork is done, that's when you get around to the important task of telling the story. Because you do have some meat, some substance to back up the claims that you're going to make, the dream that you're going to build in your story. What else is a story useful for? A story is useful when you want to propagate your ideas, when you want to define culture, you want to get people just telling them, hey, think outside the box, follow the rules, look at the rule book. This is not, this is not the way humans are wired. We don't operate that way. The way humans get convinced is when they can build empathy with the position that you're trying to take. And that happens really beautifully through stories. If you want to sell a certain recommendation that you're going to make, it is important to connect that person to whom you're selling with the dream that you're building. And then, a few different elements that all stories necessarily should have. I am really struggling with this today. Sorry. So sorry about this. All right. All stories essentially are built around the same construct from time immemorial. There are variations here and there, left and right. There's a little bit of give and take that happens. But all stories have a beginning, a middle, and the end. The beginning is when you get the audience to connect with your problem. You tell them, show them how inconvenient something is, how dark the problem is, how deep it is, how, what, how something is good, how something is bad, etc. And then the middle part is where you build a certain dream for them. If you look at Martin Luther King's great I have a dream speech, you can see elements of this playing out beautifully. The beginning part where he passionately espouses the cause of the African American people where he talks about how they've been let down, how the dream of the founding fathers, the principles for which they stood, has been completely left in shambles. And then he starts off with the I have a dream section. It's not an I have a plan section, it is an I have a dream section, where you show people what an alternate reality could look like, what the promised land could look like, what their place in that promised land would look like. And then you show them a path of how to get there. That makes a great story. There are, of course, multiple variations of this. There are many other different ways in which stories can be told. But most stories, when you decompose it to its essential bits, will fall into these categories. Let's start off with a few fundamental principles on what it means to tell a story. The very, very obvious, don't be boring, easy to say, tough to do, and I'm sure I have been guilty of doing this many, many times in the past, and I'm sure each of us who has attempted to tell a story at some point or the other will find ourselves falling into this trap. But other than that, as long as your stories are authentic, they keep it real, they don't hide the facts, they are stating problems, but not necessarily in an overly negative way. That's important. Stories that appeal to our deepest emotions, the good ones and the bad ones, joy, Hope, fear, jealousy, anger, all of these, they connect very, very strongly with us. Most stories are universal. This is why foreign movies do very well. Because most stories take an, a universal sentiment and cast it to a unique situation. So whether you're watching on Netflix a program that's made in Israel or in Spain or in India, you watch it with bated breath because these stories are fundamentally universal in their nature. 
Most of them have a clear structure and purpose. They don't overly complicate, too many plot twists, too many uh, people. Yeah, they make, maybe sometimes when they're entertaining, they're good, but if you want to drive home a message, keep it simple, have a clear structure and purpose. And most stories that are effective don't teach us anything new. They re remind and reinforce what we already fundamentally believe in. When we hear a story that reinforces our belief, we feel a little more secure, we feel a little smarter, we feel safe that what we believed is being validated through a story by somebody else who's telling us the story. So that's what makes effective stories. All right. Sorry. All right. Uh, and then most stories that are well told get us to shut down the logic part of our brain. If not shut it down, at least quiesce it a little. They get us to engage in the dream, in the what if. What if we were able to do this? What if we were to orient ourselves differently? And that is a very, very powerful force in getting a, a story to be effective, in getting the audience to co-create the dream, dream and to live the dream with you. Not all stories are good stories. Not all stories are told for good. A lot of you have probably heard about Elizabeth Holmes. Famously, the youngest woman self-made billionaire. At one point, her net worth was 4.5 billion. She had raised in excess of 900 million for a company that she founded called Theranos, which was founded on a simple premise that if you were to take very little blood from people and give them results on things like cholesterol, cancer, etc., through a screening that just took very little time, a, a company could do very well with that business model. They did very well in raising tons of money from people who are seasoned investors. Unfortunately, what she was was a great storyteller. Unfortunately, what she also was was not very ethical. So a lot of her stories were false. They were cooked up. They were made up. There was an air of secrecy around the science behind this and the fall has been dramatic. So let's not assume that all great storytellers who can convince us are ones who are doing the right thing. And if you look at, from the point of view of all of you rational left brain people, this might sound like a whole bunch of hogwash. Well, it's not, because there is a biological certainty to this. We as human beings are fundamentally wired towards stories. There are a few things that make this possible. There are three separate hormones that science has proven is important because when we listen to a story, it not just touches the mental but also the physical. There's dopamine that gets triggered. There's endorphins. There is also uh, cortisol. There's also adrenaline. So there are a bunch of good and bad chemicals that can be triggered through stories. And each story touches us in different ways. Oxytocin, it builds empathy. Endorphins gets us to be creative, gets us to be positive. If you're able to generate stories among your teammates, in, among your colleagues that generate these positive sentiments, this will in, in turn get you to be far more effective at leading your organization. In fact, science has shown that when you watch a movie, a romantic movie, the same bra brain cells fig get fired as when you are being romantic yourself. So this is actually something that people have shown through science. And why is it that young kids respond to stories and are taught through stories? Because when your brains are being, when they're at their best in terms of absorption, the best way to teach them is not a PowerPoint slide deck. How many of you have tried that? Late at night, Dad, can you tell me a story? Let me fire up my lap laptop and get a PowerPoint slide deck out. That might be really good at putting them to sleep, though, I must say. Right? I should have tried this when my kids were little. It's not, it's not a coincidence. This is something that we have evolved through centuries. It is something that has passed down generation to generation. Think about it. 100,000 years ago, language started evolving. Primitive hunter-gatherer societies started forming. They started communicating with each other through language. And this language was used as a way 
to transmit knowledge from one generation to another, things that you learned, like don't go out at night and stand next to a tiger, all of this is told through stories. And then, about 27,000 years ago, people started drawing in caves, etc. The cave paintings that you've heard, all of you have undoubtedly heard of. About 27,000 years ago is when we started transmitting these stories in the written form through diagrams. About 3,000 years ago, we started to put down these stories in text so that every generation learned. And this is a fundamental aspect of us being human. We are able to transmit knowledge not just through our DNA, but also through shared knowledge that is transmitted through stories. And then, about 30 years ago, Microsoft PowerPoint was born. You think about it. Which one do you think is going to be far more effective? So we are all storytellers. We are born that way, we are wired that way. We can all make up our own story, stories, and we are also wired to listen to stories. So if you use it wisely, in the right way, in the words of a famous investment banker, and a very, very famous investor in the likes of Uber, Bill Gurley, great storytellers have a huge advantage over people who don't who have this ability. They're likely to be more popular, they're likely to hire better, they're likely to do all the right things, be media darlings, and most importantly, especially from his point of view, they are likely to return a positive return on investment. So ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure. I hope I have delivered a positive return on your investment of time. Thank you very much. Thank you.